Morning Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution. Anita and uh, Michael, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are morning. you? Morning. Good morning, good morning Revolution. Revolution. <laughs> you guys got to hear some umph. We want to hear <laughs> umph early in the morning. We wake up, you had your coffee. I know, Michael, you mm -hmm. had yours. I need, I don't know. Are you a coffee drinker, Anita? Oh, oh yes, yes. My coffee's done, and I've moved on to tea already, so yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, me too, me yeah. too. Well, Rosanna's not with us this morning, neither is uh, Scott, but we're going to hold it down. We're going to yeah. hold it down anyway. Buckeyes, um, Team Buckeyes. Buckeyes, we're all Buckeyes in the house. All Ohio. <laughs> That's a wonderful, you know, I used to say that the epicenter of the world revolutionary process is in Ohio, in Youngstown, in particular, that mm -hmm. stretch of, 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 of territory to run from Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, let's see, that would be Cleveland East, uh, and then it goes south. south a little bit down to Pittsburgh, that whole industrial yes. I guess now it's kind of a post-industrial area. Mm -hmm. I always thought that the spark of the revolution would be lit in in that area. We'll Gus, see whether didn't not. Gus Paul used to say that Ohio prepares you for political for a political career? So he has a quote uh, about did he? Yeah, yeah something like that. Right. that it prepared me for better or worse. <laughs> And I just got a couple new members from that area too. So is that right? Well, that's mm -hmm. that's that's good news. Well, it's been quite a week, and uh, this week uh, one of the big things that happened was the House passed a uh, legislation to hold a national commission of inquiry into the events that happened on January the sixth. And um, which is a big thing. January, uh, Anita, January 6th was a big thing, but it doesn't look like the Senate is interested in. Uh, Mitch McConnell said, What is there to know? What, what more yes. is there to find out? I mean, it's done. Let's move on. You ready to move on, Anita? No, they're not ready to move on. I think there's some alternatives if the Senate doesn't pass this too that Nancy Pelosi has up her sleeve. So um, yeah, the, the Senate uh, Republicans don't want that uh, to come all out just before the midterms in uh, 22. Um, so I, I think they're really afraid of that and they have to keep the big lie alive. So that's why they're, you know, they just don't wanna, they don't wanna, uh, they just wanna gloss it over. And considering it's been compared uh, over and over to the, the Benghazi uh, investigations that took place with millions and cost millions of dollars in the, uh, in, in the past. Um, and compared to this, this is an event that really deserves to be uh, investigated. Um, so we'll see. You would think that they would want, you know, to expose that if they want to, I know there are a group of some Republicans who are trying to distance themselves from, you know, Trump's a divisive language. So you think it would be in their best interest to look into this. And especially you have to consider some of them were in danger of losing their lives. You know, they were in the set, the Senate chamber as these, you know, the terrorists were coming in. So you would think it'd be in their interest to kind of say, oh, you know, we want to defend democracy, but no, you know, yeah, I think that would help them in 2022, you know, the Republicans, but whatever. Even, even Mike, Mike Pence's was, brother. Where was it? I would say it, even Mike Pence's brother uh, voted against it. So, you know, and he was the one that they were, they were coming to hang. So. Now there were, there were uh, a group of Republicans in the house that supported it. I think maybe there were 35 or, mm -hmm. or, or 40 of them. Of course there were another 120 or 130 who had voted back in January to say that the election was stolen. Uh, if you can imagine, and uh, but nobody in the Senate, Michael, is willing to look in. I mean, uh, you know what, Michael? I'm interested in the international ties as well because you know Trump and them were organizing an international, along with Steve Bannon and the rest, an international fascist, neo-fascist faction on the basis of you know, white nationalism. I don't like that word. 
white supremacy. That's what yeah. it is. They were organizing an international conspiracy. Um, and and uh, that needs to be looked into too. They had ties with the fascists in Germany, of Brazil. course. What's the name of it? Huh? Brazil, Bolsonaro. Brazil. France. That's what's really interesting is while yeah. all that was happening, uh, you know, on Twitter. Uh, I mean, January sixth, the riots were taking place at the at the Capitol building. But Bolsonaro in Brazil, you know, the far right fascist president in Brazil he was tweeting that something like that could very well happen in Brazil to keep him in power. You know, the people come out and defend me. He was already, as Trump was saying that the November elections were a fraud, you know, that first week of November, he was saying the same thing too. Oh, if I lose the next election, it's gonna be a fraud. So they're all, you know, they all have the same outlook. They're obviously in contact with each other. And uh, then you got Italy and Spain, and as you were saying, <laughs> Anita, France. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what uh, 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 the representative Pelosi has up her sleeve, Anita, but well, I hope it has a lot, huh? I I've hope heard, it has. I've, I've heard that the de uh, Department of Justice can also call an independent commission to look into January hmm. 6th. Um, so that's a possibility in the future. And, and that could they could have even better subpoena powers also, Biden could call a commission, but uh, but I don't think he will want to do that because you know I think he wants to not look that partisan. But um, but Merrick Garland could set something up and then set them free to to be an independent investigation. So that would be a, an alternative, and I hope something is is done because I would like to see people like uh, Lauren Bab Barbet, what's her name, Babbitt, uh, from uh, the uh, the woman who may have escorted uh you know uh, demonstrators around protesters around uh the day before the insurrection to show them the lay of the land so i think i would like to see that kind of thing come out and we really need a, an independent investigation to get to that congressman from uh, youngstown and warren mr ryan gave a rouse did y'all watch that yes he gave it's only 30 seconds. It's, it's, it's good. He's, he's getting better at those. I, I, he's done a number of really uh, self-righteous, angry speeches on the floor, uh, and he's, he's getting better at it, I think. This one was good. That young man, is, well, he wants to run for Senate, governor, president. I think he tried to run for president. Yeah, he got he's ambition. Running for Senate. I think he's running for Senate. He's uh, running for the Senate. To take, he tried uh, to run for Lance, Nancy Pelosi's seat. <laughs> Uh, they they were upset with her. That's and, right. He has and, ambitions, definitely, and they might they uh, gerrymandering might take his seat away too. So um, I wasn't very happy with him because he was talking about he was running because he was he wanted to alert the world to socialism, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, Bruce Boston called up his office and said, "Hey, it wasn't socialism that took away the jobs in Mahoney County." It wasn't socialism that took away the jobs in uh, Warren. Mm -hmm. It wasn't socialism that got rid of the rubber factories in Akron. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I was, I'm glad Bruce, uh, Bruce did that. And Bruce, if you're watching, we heard you were in the hospital, so we hope you're doing better. And we want you back out in the struggle. And uh, now, uh, uh, Anita, you were talking about partisanship and um, uh, one of the uh, big issues is that there's some of the Democrats are calling um, uh, Michael on the Biden the abandoned partisanship, uh, bipartisanship, later for the Republicans on the infrastructure, just pass the goddamn thing. Just pass it. You think they're right? Or should they struggle with the Republicans to come up with some kind of compromise that will bring some of the whatever you want to call them forward. Michael? Well, <laughs> are you it's a funny. The, 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 the other night I was just reading, uh, I was rereading Left Wing Communism by Lenin, and he has a chapter called No Compromise? Question mark. And so Lenin's in my head saying, no, you got to make a compromise. But I don't think it's possible with these Republicans. And due to the situation and what the conditions are, I really think they should just pass it as it is. And then fight, you know, continue to fight along on the road, you know, let, you know, the progressives, I think we can count on them for certain things, but I think you just have to pass it as it is uh, because of 
how desperate the times are. I don't think it's possible to negotiate uh, with Republicans being who they are. Right. Now, it's one bad enough. Thing... Have... Sorry. Go they on. have they have to compromise with uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema as it is uh, to to get the the right wing of their their the Democratic Party in on it uh, before it can pass with reconciliation. So that's enough. Compromise. And that means you're compromising with the, with the Republicans, because you know that the Republicans are, you know, laying in the cut, laying in the back, you know, pulling, pulling strings and saying, you know, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you, and and all that, and all that kind of thing. So um, that's part of that process as well. But it need a infrastructure bill is really important. Absolutely. The Family Act really important mm -hmm. but um and it's going to provide thousands tens of thousands of jobs that's right but my question is is there any provision any guarantee that those jobs will uh, address the problems of people who have historically been disadvantaged and left out more than that people who, there are systemic uh, uh, divisions of labor that exclude women, that exclude black people, Latinos, the disabled. Are there any provisions in those bills that will, those tens of thousands of jobs mm -hmm. that will guarantee that I mean, you've been looking into that a little bit and studying it, not to put you on the spot. No, I have. It's really something that's dear to my heart, too, because I remember struggling with child care issues as well when I was when I had little ones at home. And I think um, one of the articles that I saw in the Post, I think, said that the pandemic has created a child care crisis. And, and, and women are the ones who are really paying the price. And that's why you saw in the latest jobs report that men took those jobs more than women did. Women are not going able to go back to the workforce because they're being offered jobs where they have 25 hours a week and uh, minimum wage. They And, and their kids have uh, schedules where they're home quite a bit. So they cannot take that off. They really need, we need, I mean, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren makes the best case for uh, childcare being an infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's just part of what we have to have before women can go back to work and be productive members of society and citizens uh, in, involved in civic action as well. So the big question is, are there, those, are there those provisions there and are they adequate? And I'm not willing to accept it on face value mm -hmm. because Michael, what happened during the uh, subprime crisis, which was targeted, these mortgage companies, they almost brought the planet down, by the way. They targeted Black and Latino and elderly people with subprime loans. That means that you pay more for mm -hmm. the loans, right? And then they had ballooning interest rates. After five, six years, the interest rates went up. And you were paying four or $500, all of a sudden it went to a thousand. Mm -hmm. You were like, holy shit. I didn't, I didn't know. And then they couldn't pay it. And then the, the banks knew, Michael, what was happening. And then they, they, they took out bets on who was going to fail. <laughs> they were speculating on it. They called that shorting the, and, 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 and with these, what they call these toxic instruments. Anyway, they knew it was going to happen. They ripped all of these people off, Michael. They almost brought down the world e economy. It was the biggest wealth loss in Black and Latino history. And we never recovered from it. Even the eight years of the Obama administration, Black Latino home ownership is less than what it, we never recovered. Mm -hmm. So my question is, with respect to the infrastructure and the Family Act, what's going to happen to all of us who have been pushed out of the labor market, 
can't get back because of child care and, and so on. That's a big issue. Michael, that's a big issue. I think it'll, it may help people, but I don't think it's going to be a, a long-term solution. Again, I, I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois, and who we quote in our party program saying capitalism can't be reformed. And there are reforms that are implemented. It does help people, you know, in the short term. But I think long term, I don't think Black and Latino people are going to recover from that. Not until there's a, a, a true, a fundamental, even revolutionary change in, in the system that we have here. I just don't see it happening. Um, and it's interesting we're talking about this because I'm thinking about a lot of the Latino families I know back home, not, you know, Ohio, even here in New York, who they were, many of them were homeowners at one time and they've uh, downsized, which is one word for it, uh, going, you know, in the past 20 years, uh, downsizing to an apartment, you know, they lost their home, they lost their jobs, so forth. So it is, I, I don't know if, if this infrastructure plan and the Family Act is going to be enough to do it, but it'll help, I think, some people in the short term, yeah. We have to fight for it. It has to be passed, and including the $15 minimum wage, because 30%, raising that wage will bring 30% of Black and Latino families out of poverty. You know, it's that important of a, of a measure. And then you take that and you take the tax credit that they put into the infrastructure plan for working families. That will also help. But I think you need affirmative action measures, Anita. Hmm. There's a dirty word now. You say <laughs> quota, affirmative action, it's a dirty word. They don't even talk about it. Hmm. It's a wedge issue. But without that, you know, there's really no uh, guarantee. And uh, those who need it the most will be, will be left out. And that, hmm. that can't happen. I think I think the the way the bills are drawn up by by uh, by people who whose concerns are with the the uh, black and Latino uh, homeowners and and workers and people who have lost their homes. I think I think the way they're crafting those bills are to target those groups, even though they might not you know have a they don't have a race test or any quota or anything like that. They're they're really aiming at the uh, the people who need the help the most economically and and that is that's black and latino people but it's also poor white uh families as well who uh especially single parent families that that really need help uh as well so i think um it's targeting economic an economic group on economic well, they, if they want to win the midterms and a lot of this is directed at the midterms and the next presidential election they damn well better help Youngstown and Warren and Akron and, and Michigan and and uh, and uh, Indiana and uh, those swing states, mm -hmm. black, white, Latino men and women. But without affirmative action, we're gonna get left out. You watch what I'm saying has happened every single time, and and there has to be those special, we call that in the Leninist tradition, special compensatory measures. Mm -hmm. That's what's needed. That's what's needed. And if you don't have that, there's no guarantee. Another big issue this week was ceasefire in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Ceasefire in Gaza after reigning terror on that 22 mile strip, 2 million people, children, whole families wiped out. Michael, terrible tragedy. And now Bernie Sanders was calling, what Michael is calling for cutting military aid? Cutting military aid to Israel, yeah. And the argument is that um, the Biden administration, US government in general is way out of touch with the democratic base. Uh, who believes this war, these uh, efforts to be unpopular because, you know, UX, U.S. Tech taxpayers don't want to fund any wars, um, especially, you know, uh, such an inhumane, during a pandemic, you got to think this is all happening during a pandemic, that they're bombing Gaza, you know, children are dying, and um, there were reports coming out of, you know, it's not a religious conflict. There are uh, Palestinian Christians and uh, Jews, you know, Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews getting caught in the, in the crossfire. You know, and I thought what was the most powerful thing of, of uh, this uprising, because it was an international movement, there were protests in Dublin, Ireland, Chicago, Illinois, you know, all across the world, 
uh, waving the Palestinian flag, demanding you know a, a peaceful solution out of this, uh, freedom for Palestine. I thought it was just so powerful that um, people like uh, Rashida Tlaib of, of, of uh, Palestinian descent, you know, representative from Michigan, uh, took the 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 floor in Congress, and uh, you know Ayanna Pressley, Ilhan Omar, you know, also uh, of Muslim background. And uh, really pushed Biden to um, at least, you know, address a ceasefire and come out in, in support of a ceasefire, which he didn't have to do. That honestly uh, surprised me. Um, and even Schumer here in New York, he was pretty quiet on it, uh, you know, because of the large Jewish population here in New York. And so I think, um, again, we may be looking at another summer of, of, of uprisings, you know, even though it's a ceasefire. I think that these, you know, the, the Palestinian question has really been called. Uh, and addressed in a way that, you know, it's, it's really uh, raised people's awareness about it. And so we'll see uh, what's going what's gonna, to uh, go forward. Because again, even though the bombing stopped, uh, Gaza goes months without electricity sometimes. You know, they, uh, the people can't acquire um, passports, visas, you know, easily to leave. And so in many ways, you know, it's not, uh, the crisis hasn't ended. Are we moving, you think that the pressure, Anita, is moving towards, they say that there's a split in the Democratic Party now on this issue. That, 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 uh, do you think that that's true? And do you think I, it's gonna be enough to push the administration in another direction? I think it, it, it isn't, I wouldn't call it a split in the Democratic Party. I think the Democratic Party is evolving towards a more critical stance um, towards Israel and its policies. Um, I think we, um, I, I, I think we've talked in the, on this program before about the uh, contradiction between a progressive domestic policy and a regressive uh, foreign policy. And I think we are seeing some of that contradiction take place. Rashida Tlaib actually uh, buttonholed uh, Biden on the tarmac uh, in Michigan when he came to visit. And he did say nice words about her uh, wishing her grandmother, who lives back there, uh, well in in his talk to, to Michigan workers. So I think he has he's he's been pushed. He's gotten more. I think he's you know gotten the message, and and it is our um, Jewish legislators like uh, John Ossoff and Bernie Sanders who are really taking the lead. Bernie uh, Sanders introduced legislation to at least have a debate about it on the floor of the, uh, the Senate. So um, I think they're the ones that are really taking the lead uh, there. Big changes are necessary. They need to end the occupation and need to get rid of that right wing government. They say there, there was a maneuver on the part of Bibi's part to stay in power so he'll stay his behind out of jail. He's on his way to jail, Michael. <laughs> so that's an issue as well. Well. Um, uh, I think that that does it for this week. Uh, we'll be, we will be back next week, uh, same time, same station. Do we have any programs coming up, Michael, in the next week or two that we want to bring people's attention to? Any webinars, any, any educationals, any good articles? Um, if not, uh, we will end it, end it here. Um, so stay strong, stay safe, and stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. Take care. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.